All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. My name is Gary Tintero. I'm director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and delighted to welcome you to a member's lecture given by Kenitra Fletcher for Odyssey, Jack Whitten Sculpture, 1963 to 2017. The exhibition, which is two floors above, is uh, brought to us thanks to funding by Bridget and Patrick Wade and Gary Mercer. Especially grateful to Gary Mercer for his longtime support of projects here at the museum. You're going to be hearing all about Jack Whitten uh, from Kenitra. Um, all I can add is that I was deeply moved by the exhibition when I saw it at the Metropolitan Museum's Royer Building uh, earlier, uh, earlier in the season. Uh, it had inaugurated at the Baltimore Museum of Art, and it was a co-production of Baltimore and the Met. But it was a larger show with many more paintings. And we felt, um, as a kind of tag-along, we had uh, the opportunity to um, take advantage of space that hadn't been programmed adjacent to the Sally Mann exhibition. And we felt that it would be a great compliment to the Sally Mann show to have Jack Whitten's sculpture, especially. Uh, we wanted to uh, pro provide an opportunity for people to reflect on two very different artists who emanated from the South, who in some way reflect on, on, on their Southernness and their Americanness in their art, but do so through very different vehicles and means. And uh, of course, Jack Whitten's sculptures were not produced in the South. He left the South early, early in his life, um, was a resident of uh, New York City for much of his adult life. But these works, as you'll learn, were produced, the sculpture were produced on the island of Crete, uh, where he would spend three or four months every year with his wife Mary, who joins us in the audience today, and we're, we're honored by her uh, presence, as well as her daughter, um, Rissimi? Morsini. So thank you both for being here. Um, Kenitra Fletcher is a new addition to our staff here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. She is assistant curator of modern and contemporary art, but she's not new to Houston. In fact, like many of us, she is a native Houstonian. And like many of us, went to school in the East. Uh, she got her bachelor's at Rutgers and her master's at UT Austin. And although she's here tonight, she's currently pursuing her PhD with Cornell University are happy not to be in the snow belt at this, at this very moment. Uh, Kenitra has been a marvelous addition to our staff, and this exhibition is her inaugural solo installation. She did it all by herself, and it's a magnificent exhibition. Sculpture, I think, is very difficult to install, uh, given that it has to be seen from so many different vantage points and lit from a few, not just one. Flatware, as we call it, paintings and drawings are much more easily, easily arranged in a room. Sculpture requires, I think, the greatest amount of thought and sensibility. And Kenitra has acquitted herself beautifully in this her inaugural exhibition. So very pleased to hear what Kenitra has to say about Jack Whitten sculpture, Kenitra Fletcher. Thank you, Gary. Um, and also thank you to my colleague, uh, curator Allison Green. Um, Gary and Allison were so helpful and I thank them for their support, their advice, and their encouragement. Um, as well as numerous departments here at the museum, uh, design, preparations, registration, graphics, and learning and inter interpretation who help realize our exhibitions and programs. Um, a very special thank you to Hauser and Worth Gallery, uh, specifically Michael, Tate, and Sarah uh, for their diligence diligence in facilitating loans, um, shipping, and correspondence, and uh, the curators Katie Siegel at the Baltimore Museum of Art and uh, Kelly Baum at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, the f where, as Gary said, were the first two venues of Odyssey. 
And they also edited and contributed to the beautiful catalog that we have available in the shop and online. And um, thank you again to Bridget and Patrick Wade and Gary Mercer for their support. And I finally want to express uh, my deep gratitude to the Witten family, uh, Mary, Jack Witten's wife, Mercini, his daughter, and Greg, also uh, his son-in-law. Um, they're here today and they generously agreed to extend the tour of Odyssey and share Witten's extraordinary sculptures with Houston. So we are deeply honored. So as you can see, I'm going to start at the beginning <laughs> and um, give you an overview of Witten's biography and intersperse with images and descriptions of the works that you see on view upstairs. Uh, so it all began in 1939 in Bessemer, Alabama. Witten was the son of Annie a seamstress who later opened Witten Kindergarten School in Bessemer, Alabama, uh, and Mose, he's the son of Mose, a coal miner who passed when uh, Witten was only eight years old. Um, he grew up in a very segregated era and area of the United States, American apartheid as he called it, and the experiences that he had of being poor and having to make do and be inventive with the materials that were on hand were informative and would feed into his artistic practice. Um, as he said, Southerners do not throw anything away. Wynn was creative and artistically inclined young man. Uh, he played tenor saxophone and was in the high school marching band and a dance band called the Jazzettes. He also was his high school's artist. Um, he made all the posters and decorations for the school dances and other events. But as a profession, the arts were not encouraged by the adults in his family. They thought it was nice that he was able to do that, but they didn't think that art was something that you could do for a living. In segregated Alabama, um, African Americans were not allowed into art museums, except for only one day of the year. So uh, black children were often shown the still mill and told that that's where they would end up. But uh, fortunately, Witten was a, um, a very good student and a gifted in science. And he went to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama as a pre-med student with the goal of becoming a doctor in the Air Force. Um, but in the back of his mind, he knew that he always wanted to study art. And two years later, in ROTC class, he stood up in the middle of class in full uniform, which was not done, and said repeatedly, what am I doing here? And soon after, he transferred to Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana to study art, as Tuskegee did not have an art program. Uh, while in Baton Rouge, he became involved in uh, the civil rights demonstrations. He had met uh, Martin Luther King in Alabama and was inspired by the, his precepts of nonviolence. And in Baton Rouge, he organized a march on the state capitol uh, that became a personal turning point for him. Um, it was supposed to be peaceful, but it turned violent uh, when counter protesters arrived. Although the marchers did not react or resist, uh, feces and urine were thrown on them and they were beat with sticks as they walked towards the Capitol. And after that experience, Witten knew that he had to leave the South. He thought that either he was gonna get killed or he was going to kill somebody. So he threw all of his possessions into a lake near Southern University and boarded a Greyhound bus headed for New York City. And while Witten was a student at Tuskegee, um, he had expressed an interest in art to an architecture professor and who mentioned the Cooper Union to him. He said that the school was tuition free and in New York City. So when he arrived in New York, uh, he applied to Cooper Union and he was accepted into the painting program where he had his first experience of being in a classroom with white teachers and students. During this transformative time, uh, being a, a young artist in New York City in the early 60s when the art world was open and smaller than it is now, uh, Witten was mentored by painters Willem de Kooning and Norman Lewis. He came to know Franz Klein, Romare Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, Barnett Newman, and he also knew many writers, Ishmael Reed, uh, Leroy Jones, later known as Amiri Baraka, uh, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, and as well, and numerous jazz musicians, which included John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, and um, Thelonious Monk. And Witten became known as a painter. At first, he created um, abstract expressionist work. His first love was Arshal Gorky, and he very much admired Willem de Kooning. And you can see their influences in works such as Garden and Bessemer VI from 1968. Um, this is a painting that combines abstraction with figuration and landscape and memories of his home in Alabama with the chaotic political, con political context of the civil rights movement in the rural South. 
By the early 70s, he has switched gears and began to paint large-scale abstract experimental works that are process-oriented. Um, they're fairly sculptural and they draw attention to the manipulation of paint. And he used a range of tools such as squeegees, saws, and uh, even afro picks. And he also created the large-scale rig that you see here that he called the developer. And it was this enormous uh, tool, as you can see, that he used to move and push the paint um, in one gesture. He also created works with a frottage-like technique in which he developed small objects, excuse me, in which he placed small objects underneath the canvas to create the rough texture surfaces that you see in Delta Group 2, which is on view upstairs. Um, he inserted pebbles and wire underneath this canvas, and then he painted and raked over the canvas to create these, the dynamic striations that you see. The painting actually could be called a relief because of the raised areas that resulted from where he um, placed the objects underneath the canvas dur during its making. But at the same time, he was conducting um, a parallel experiment in sculpture, producing an entirely unknown body of work. Winton began carving wood in 1962 while he was a student at Cooper Union um, as he became interested in African sculpture. He began reading about it and seeing it as he regularly visited museums such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Brooklyn Museum of Art but he didn't think he was getting enough of what he needed to understand the forms. So he figured the best way to understand it was to make it himself. And Lovers is one of the earliest works in the exhibition, and it shows two in intertwining heads with geometric abstracted faces connected to a, cor a contorted net-like form. Um, this work was made as a reflection on his relationship with his first wife, Florence Squires, and it draws, on, it draws formally from his study of African mass. This work, like many of its early one, earlier ones, was carved out of discarded American elm wood that Winton gathered at a city dump in Kent Cliffs, New York. In the early 1960s, Winton spent weekends at a friend's farmhouse there. And this friend, Jeff Waite, taught Winton carpentry and cabinet making, and Winton actually eventually became a skilled cabinet maker. And through the late 60s and even into the early 70s, he had a business making money working uh, with Waite in cabinetry. Earlier works also, early works also include Jughead 1 and 2, which are inspired by Southern sculptural traditions. And the forms are a play on face jugs that were made by enslaved potters uh, in the mid-19th century in and around South Carolina. And from the beginning, we can see Witten's interest in the use value in art. That is, like African sculpture, the works are often functional in some manner. And for instance, the jug heads have handles that suggest portability. Some scholars also believe that face jugs are, have roots in Central Africa and would have contained power. And interestingly, uh, Witten's daughter, Mersini, told me that these two jug heads were in opposite corners of the studio. And so he saw them as kind of watching him and coaxing him to you know, keep going, keep working and painting. And in many ways, Witten saw his sculptures as animate and filled with spirit and powers. Like, a, like much of Witten's sculpture, these works also were created by direct carving meaning that he designed the form as he went along with no preconceived plan in mind and, and no power tools. And the faceted texture of the surfaces reflect this handmade process. And they are layered with black shoe polish, which has personal significance. Um, proper self-presentation was important to the adults in his community. There was a high value placed on um, having shined shoes. So in a way, he's properly presenting this, work, this piece by polishing it in this manner. Wynn also wanted to, under, so Wynn wanted to understand works formally by making them, but also culturally and the ways that they um, related to him as a person of African descent and to African American identity in general. And homage to Malcolm very much exemplifies this type of investigation. Homage to Mal Malcolm was made the summer after Malcolm X's assassination in 1965. It's carved from a single piece of Elmwood, and the work uh, certainly recalls a body or a corpse. Um, in reference to the fallen civil rights leader. It combines several motifs and devices that recall African visual traditions, such as the pointed horn, um, a symbol of power in many African sculptures, the non-centralized composition, which you see in many African headdresses, and then also the segment uh, that has many metal objects driven into it that are referenced to um, Nkisi, or African power figures. And these are objects that are thought to house spiritual forces. So a ritual specialist would drive nails into those objects whenever someone needed to release the power within it. 
So all of these details allude to the status of Malcolm X as a powerful, protective figure and connect the leader to Africa or his ancestral homeland. So many of the works at the start of the exhibition are earlier works in 1960s and 70s that feature, that refer to human attributes. You see faces and heads, as we saw in Lovers and um, Jugheads, as well as an ancestral totem and Mersini's doll. Uh, to make the former, Witten carved the trunk of a birch tree that felled in the woods of Kent Cliffs. And it's just over 10 feet tall and features abstracted faces that pay homage to African and American ancestors. Some have friendly smiles and some are more severe. And the head of a llama sits at the top as a self-portrait of the artist. And Witten became interested in representing uh, the history, as, family history as a column after seeing a totem pole uh, by the Haida peoples of British Columbia during a visit to the Brooklyn Museum. And the faces also generally relate to forms of African sculpture. And Mersini's doll is just that. It's a doll that he made for his daughter Mersini when she was three years old. It has a circular face with two lines for eyes and a triangle for the nose uh, placed on top of the strong legs. And like Jughead one and two, it has a doll, the doll has a handle for, uh, for her daughter to carry the work with her, excuse me, to carry the piece around with her. Um, also, in making this work, he followed the example of his relatives in Alabama, and instead of giving his child a typical store-bought white doll, doll, he created a doll that, with wood that um, very much resembled the skin tone of his daughter. In addition to faces and heads, there are many anthropomorphic forms that generally refer to the human body, such as bushwoman, seen here, which is a column with globular shapes that suggest breasts and buttocks. Part of the piece, um, is also dense with metal pieces that you can pluck and like an instrument to produce sound. And Anthropos 1, 2, and 3. And Witten explained that these sculptures are about the beginning, the genesis of people. And the titles anthrop Anthropos come from the Greek word for man or humankind. And each of these works stands upright in a bipedal posture like that of a human being. And they're carved from black mulberry although number one also incorporates olive tree and linen twine. And while these works appear human, they're also abstract in various ways. Uh, number one has twisting branches of sharpened wood that project from the front. And, as you, and you can see a range of shapes also. Um, in, in Anthropos number two, uh, we have rectangular forms set at various angles. And then we also had an ovoid and a cube in number three. And they also have varied surface qualities. The works are both textured and matte, and they have dark patinas that are the result of Witten using lin lin excuse me, linseed oil that darkens over time. The geometric forms also relate to African sculpture and recall the long neck and torso and the short arms and legs of African Fang and Lulawa sculptures. And the series was also informed by ancient Cycladic art, especially the austere marble figures that were made 5,000 years ago. And so you'll see throughout the exhibition that many of the labels include works on view that are, that are on view elsewhere in the museum that are the type of works that inspired Witten and relate formally and thematically to Witten's pieces. And works such as Anthropos also reflect how Witten often sought um, commonalities and connections between different cultures, specifically African and Greek cultures. Uh, the merging of these two cultures does have some personal significance. Uh, Witten married Mary, Mary Stikos, uh, who is Greek American in November of 1968. And in the summer of 1969, the couple traveled to Greece, a trip that was the start of a long relationship and love of, of the nation. Notably, a couple of nights before leaving for this trip, Witten had a dream in which he saw a tree and was told to take his carving tools and find this tree and carve it into a totem. The couple arrived in Athens, spent time there, and didn't find this tree. And the city got expensive for them, so they made their way to Crete, which was much cheaper, and ended up in the village of Aya Galini. And there, Witten spotted the tree from his dream. It's a 13-foot-tall eucalyptus tree that he found in the town plaza. And when the owner of the prop property, whose name is Strati Trulinos, uh, understood what Witten wanted to do, he took the artist to his home, and it was then revealed that Trulinos was a cabinet maker himself, and he gave Witten tools to work on the tree. And Witten worked on that tree every day, and the townspeople watched and gave him gifts of food uh, and um, drinks as he worked. 
And in the tree, he carved uh, waves of the sea, an octopus that wraps around the trunk, as well as fish, and the head of a fisherman that's looking onto the sea. And the Wittens became known throughout the village because of this tree, and it remains there to this day. And the Wittens began to live a, sort of a divided life. In New York, he worked on the paintings nine months of the year, and in the end of May, he, they headed to Greece, and he worked on sculpture for the summer. He also did not sell or exhibit the sculpture in any significant manner. The one time was in Crete in a small exhibition that you see on the right um, on, the, on the beach as a part of a festival celebrating the 100th anniversary of the founding of Aya Galini. And so the work primarily stayed in Greece and, and there Witten expanded his sculptural practice in response to the local materials and motifs as well as the antiquities. And beginning in the second gallery, you'll see that he made many reliquaries, objects filled with mementos that serve as dedications and commemorations. Some pay respect to places. Memory container you see here uh, commemorates the entire community of Aya Galini. The planar form recalls ancient Cycladic art, and it's two-sided with two compartments on either side. They have transparent covers. Uh, revealing faded snapshots of Witten's family and friends surrounded by twigs of olive leaves and bones on one side. And on the other side, you see the face of Apollo on a bake note, along with animal bones and plant matter, suggesting the long history and the flora and the fauna of Greece. Critico Spiti also can be seen as a celebration of place, as the title means Cretan house in Greek. The work is carved from Cretan walnut and bridges the space between the floor and the wall and is made from six stacked segments. Um, at the bottom, it rests on a wedge and grows into a long bow. Next is a thin platform here, and then a trapezoidal piece, um, an arch, and then a block that looks like a roof. And the top portion houses a ceramic figurine of a girl uh, sitting daintily in a ruffled dress. And this figurine is a type of party favor that Cretans would give out at special events such as baptisms and weddings. So overall, all the piece celebrates uh, the ceremonial traditions and family life of Greece. Other reliquaries pay respect to animal life in the natural world of Greece. The death of fishing serves as a reliquary and is a haunting piece. It's a long, thin, vertical form resembling a seed pod or a fishing lure. And it also suggests a human body. It hangs from the ceiling by fishing wire wrapped around the neck, and the form has been hollowed out and then filled with Witten's own fishing paraphernalia. So nets, looks, um, excuse me, nets, hooks, lures, and wires, and bones from local fish are all inside like relics from a reliquary. And the piece evokes both racial violence of lynching and the bygone fishing industry in Crete, two matters that resonated with the artist. He grew up in the se segregated South where he saw horrible atrocities and he grew up hunting and fishing in Alabama and continued to do so in his, during his summers in Greece. So he lamented the loss of Crete's once vital fishing industry. Witten created works in response to the, pounted, the pointed power form that he observed in the animals of Greece. Homage to Cree Cree pays respect to the threatened species of wild goat, the Cree Cree, that lives in the White Mountains of Crete. Witten saw the Cree Cree only once in his 50 summers on the island, and it is one of the few horned animals in Crete. And in this work, the horn points downwards to suggest that the, goat, the goat's declining population. And the allusion to Minkisi also suggests Witten's desire to um, protect the species, perhaps. He also embedded his own shredded American Express card in th into the work, as perhaps a gesture to suggest the connection between power and money and how they play a role in, um, in animal endanger endangerment. The scorpion is a local arachnid in Crete that has a pair of pincers and a venomous stinger at the end of its tail for hunting and self-defense. And scorpions also like to hide in cool places, so Witten had to be very careful to remove the bark from the wood that he stored uh, so he wouldn't encounter one later. And in this piece, the long central spike at the top recalls the scorpion stinger, and the piece looks as if it's rearing back, ready to strike. Diavolaki, while not an actually, not actually an animal, as Diavolaki means little devil in Greek, um, this piece does have the presence of a creature, and it has horns at the top, or they could be seen as eyes, as the piece actually leans forward as if it's looking at you inquisitively. And in shark bait, 
We have several pointed marble pieces that are irregularly placed along the length of the mulberry. Um, this is wood that was repurposed from the frame of an old doorway. And it appears to float on blue light. And that's because Witten painted the underside of the wood blue so that it would reflect on these slabs of marble. So the materials and the colors, the play with light, and the reference to sharp teeth all uh, suggest the atmosphere of Crete. And there are works that commemorate specific people that Witten admired, such as John Lennon Altarpiece. The title and the construction of this work reflects Witten's interest in the ritual function of African art. The cylindrical body resembles a human form. The torso is covered in a mass of metal objects, screws, nails, hinges, keys, locks, that contrasts with the light colored and smooth wood of the legs and suggests certain Minkisi. Witten's piece also features a compartment with brown rice and a fork and a spoon on either side of it uh, as a reference to the medicinal plants or animal matter that are often found within abdomen of Minkisi. And overall, the work connects a religious and spiritual meaning to the musician and the activist John Lennon. And Witten and Winning continued to incorporate metal objects as a reference to Minkisi throughout his career. Other works that feature um, details that, to, that suggest power figures include the saddle. And this work incorporates walnut and black mul mulberry. These are materials that are used in traditional Cretan furniture. And at one end are blocks of mulberry fastened together with, a hand, with handmade dowels. And at the other end is a smooth sloping form that suggests a saddle. The center portion of the sculpture appears almost ignited by the metal components and provides a surprising contrast with the wood. And throughout the exhibition, there are countless um, innovative, fascinating combinations of shapes and textures, it, because Wynne always keeps your eyes moving across these surfaces, surfaces and closely peering at them. And you'll want to do so with this piece, because this piece includes tiny images of women's faces within the mass of nails, um, which slightly turns the piece into um, a sort of a symbol of male heterosexual desire. And so we can see the title as a nod to the words of the use of the words like saddle or riding in reference to sex. Bosom for Aunt Serlina um, both evokes Minkisi and pays homage to a person that Witten admired, his Aunt Serlina, who ran a successful cafe in Bessemer. She is repaid respect with a form that suggests her physique. The top portion has broad shoulders, and the center convex triangle suggests a rounded belly and it's complemented by a curved posterior um, connected to leg forms. Animal bones, metal items, stones, string, and other materials are embedded in both sides of the sculpture to suggest the matriarchal, matriarchal power and the strength of Selena's character. The Afro-American thunderbolt appears in the air like a thunderbolt being thrown by the Greek god Zeus. And fittingly, the work has sides of sides of copper, which theoretically would conduct electricity you know, from the lighting. And on alternating angular pieces of wood are sections covered in bent and twisted nails that refer to Congolese Minkisi and augment the dynamic power of the thunderbolt. And the wedding. This work has been described as a marriage between two distinct heritages. The wild cypress is indigenous to southern Greece, which is the bride. And the scrap metal is salvaged, salvaged from a agricultural school in southern Crete, and it represents the groom. And both of which are supported by a black marble at the base here from Mozambique, uh, which serves as the best man, which is important in Greek culture, and it, it's meant to um, uphold the marital couple. And so, with, and I think you'll see when you're in front of it that the mass of the copper that's uh, strewn about through the metal objects. Um, it's, it's like an Nkisi, but it, in that it gives this impression of this coiled energy that's like waiting to be released when you're in front of it. And it would not be um, until 2000 that the Wittens visited Africa. So Witten had won a grant in 1962 that he planned to use for travel to Ghana, but um, due to family issues, uh, he decided to stay in US and use the money for expenses. But his interest in Ghanaian art and culture remained. And it's reflected in works such as Heart of Humanity. This work references the shape and proportions of an Asante fertility figure, or an Akuaba, uh, from Ghana. At the center of the sculpture is a spear, which is the heart of the piece, and which appears to be protected by armature composed by, of triangular segments with tips that just barely meet in the middle. And this is quite skillfully made detail. Nothing in this piece is inset. 
So the sphere and the segments were carved out of wood without disturbing the surface, which is very difficult to do. Um, in 2000, the Wittens did finally make it to Africa um, when they visited Egypt, they, and then they took a trip across the Sinai to St. Catherine's, the oldest running monastery in existence, and the following year, in 2001, they went to Senegal. Mary and Jack also visited the pyramids while in Egypt, which had been long been an inspiration as seen in Sphinx. And this happens to be the first, sculpt, first of his sculptures to link African and Greek cultures long before he went to either places. And in 1966, that was a transitional period in the US when the civil rights era was moving into a period where you saw the rise of the black power movements. And many young black activists uh, looked to and identified with African nations fighting for independence and, and liberation from the countries that had colonized them. And there was widespread pan-Africanist ideas in which ancient Egyptian achievements were seen as a part of black history. And Winton drew inspiration from the human-like, the human slash lion form of the great Sphinx of Giza in making his own hybrid form for Sphinx. And a Sphinx also is a hybrid part bird mythical monster in Greek lore, and I'm often shown with curled wings and a tail, um, which the sinuous midsection of the sculpture evokes. And also, if you look underneath the disc, when you, when you go to see this piece upstairs, you'll see that it has um, incised eyes and a bird's beak. And interestingly, Witten would take the sculpture apart and ink the relief that you see on top and use it, as, uh, use it to make woodblock prints. So in the final gallery, you'll see several symbols of power and protection and works that feature technological innovations of the past and present. And there are several blades on view that are made from marble that Witten sourced locally in Crete. And many of them refer to mythological subjects, such as Aphrodite's lover and Pluto, uh, who comes with a hood that you can see upstairs in the exhibition. Um, the hood was made by a friend of Witten's in Greece, and Witten felt that Pluto needed something to protect him when he traveled, because to prepare the sculpture for travel, he would uh, remove the marble slab, and then he placed the hood on the top of the wooden element, another example of the ways in which Witten saw his works as animate. Also, Apollonian sword is on view, the making of which is involved, it, which involved a painstaking process. Um, he worked the, mulberry, the black mulberry wood by scoring, scoring it with a chainsaw. Then he drilled holes into it and set, the, and set the wooden base on fire. Then after polishing the marble by hand, he placed it inside the wood and held it all together with a single pin. But then he uh, poured molten lead into the piece and allowed it to ooze out from the interior to the exterior to create the striking pattern that you see on the outside. And the density of that lead is what anchors the sculpture. And he borrowed this technique from ancient Greek architecture because he had known that the builders of the Parthenon in Athens um, secured the, marl the columns into their bases with molten lead. And there are works that, as I said, that merged um, the pre-industrial pre past with modern technology, such as technological totem pole. And this piece features natural materials juxtaposed with parts of obsolete techn technological devices. Um, Witten aged the wooden pole um, at the top by creating deep incisions, and he also uh, burned a hole into it with fire, making it a cyclops. And the sway of the pole follows the organic shape of the tree and recalls the sinuousness of Minoan art. And Witten then grafted technological components. Inside the neck here, we have a clock that's set to local time as instructed. And uh, there's a remote control, batteries, two flip phones, uh, loops of copper wire and multicolored cable. And Witten called the gray marble base at the bottom the charger. And Lucy, uh, Witten said had a lot of history to this piece. On um, one level, he was looking to earlier works. He made Lucy in 2011, but he, made, he used it, uh, the center black column it came from a, work, a piece that he was working on in the 1970s. And the chiseled segments in the dark patina uh, recall the Anthropos series that I showed you earlier. Um, so on one level, the work speaks to you know earlier works. On one level, uh, the history that he spoke of uh, speaks to these earlier works he used. And on another level, it speaks to the long history of mankind. Uh, the title refers to the three million year old skeleton named Lucy that was found in Ethiopia in 1974. 
Um, that skeleton was about three and a half feet tall, and this center segment of Lucy is about three and a half feet tall as well. And the segment sits on Cretan stone from the ancient town of Festos, and a block of mahogany and a steel I-beam. And so we have references to the Stone Age, uh, the Wood Age, and the Iron Age, or 19th or 20th century industry and moder modernity. And Lucy is topped by a head of wire, nails, and circuit boards to suggest that this ancient figure is still alive and buzzing with information, or as Witten said, it quote, thrust her into the modern world. I also want to note that throughout the exhibition, um, you'll see three guardian figures. And these are a series of works that Witten made to protect, his, to protect himself and his immediate family. Uh, the first is Guardian One for Mary. It's sitting on a shelf in the second gallery. Then we have Guardian Two for Mercini, which is a corner piece that, um, excuse me, a corner piece in the last gallery that hangs amongst the blades. And it also has a blade shape that's modeled after the crested helmets that you see in West African Abeji figures. And finally, we have Guardian Three for Jack, which hangs on the wall in the third gallery. And this piece has a, a gorgeous section at the bottom, um, which I think you can see right here, where he's wrapped this turquoise, this really powerfully blue uh, fishing line around the, the piece. And interestingly, Guardian One for Mary and Guardian Two for Mercini have secret seal compartments um, that contain a substance that only Witten knew and likely something potent and meant to protect his wife and his daughter. So while this is a sculpture exhibition, we do have several examples of Witten's paintings um, on view. In the mid to late 80s, uh, he started building, pa building paintings much as he did sculptures, making works that hardly count as paintings in the, tradi the traditional sense. And he would say he doesn't paint a painting, he makes a painting. And so in essence, he was constructing works that are made from paint. Excuse me, sorry. For instance, um, Mass 3 is a carved piece of styrofoam that he then embedded in a thick field of acrylic paint mixed with hair and later attached broken eggshells around it. Again, always finding um, some use out of materials surrounding him, such as the hair and even shells that were left over after opening eggs. Door to Manhattan is another built work um, made from acrylic paint pieces that Witten poured into molds or brushed onto flat surfaces, then cured and assembled onto the canvas. And specifically, he assembled pieces of acrylic that were molded from the graded surface of the cellar doors that you see on sidewalks throughout New York City. And I encourage you to look deeply um, at the bottom half of this work, where you see release of, of detritus from the streets of Manhattan. Um, here we see uh, a cassette tape. There's actually a couple of fishes right here. And um, there are objects that, that are still embedded inside the work, where pieces of blue and red plastic protrude from the canvas. Um, so you counter the gritty surfaces of the streets of Manhattan, which he has taken from the ground and placed on the canvas upright to appear like a door or a portal or a threshold of some sort. And um, you know, much of the experience uh, in, in Manhattan, uh, being in Manhattan, is pounding the pavement and uh, walking through the streets on these hard surfaces, surrounded by debris, especially back in the late 80s when he started making this piece. And so with this piece, we see when elevating and calling attention to aspects of city life that often go overlooked. Uh, Wynn also said that the most important influence on painting is the sculpture. And this is most evident in his mosaic-like works, which comprise his back monolith series. And this is a series that he began in 1998. Instead of using a paintbrush, Witten made these works from acrylic paint molds of found objects, often plastic pack packaging, um, bottle caps, or the bottom bottles themselves. And I have to note that when I met with uh, Mary and Mercini for lunch a couple of days ago, they, sat, they had bottles of water with them. And they started looking at the bottoms of them, and I was like, what are they doing? And they, they, and they said, oh, well, you know, Jack would always use uh, the bottom of the bottles as molds, and all of these bottles have different shapes. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but I've never noticed that all plastic bottles have different shapes on the bottom of them. And so, you know, they were looking at them, and then Mary leaned back, and she said, oh, we're still working for him. So, <laughs> so um, after making the molds, um, 
went and would cut and break and grind them, grind them and individually shape them and place them on the canvas like small tiles of, of tesserae and to construct the paintings. And depending on the thickness or the transparency of the pig, pigment, as well as the angles or positioning of the, t of the tiles, you know, he could reflect and direct light however he wanted. And so the black monoliths are a large, are large powerful works that pay homage to giants of black cultural history. Witten wrote, I could, quote, I could spend the rest of my life adding to my series of black monolith paintings. There are so many black monoliths in the history of African Americans. Our history of survival in America is defined both by the deeds of the collective and of the independent activists working in a variety of disciplines. And these works represent uh, people who excelled in fields of music, literature, sports, visual arts, and politics, such as the trailblazing uh, Congresswoman Barbara Jordan from Houston. And as many Houstonians know, Jordan was a woman of many firsts. She was the first African-American elected to the Texas Senate uh, since Reconstruction. She was the first black woman in the Texas legislature, uh, the first African-American from the South to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, and the first African-American woman to be buried in the Texas State Cemetery. And this work uh, was made about two years after Jordan's death, and it features black tesserae <clears throat> excuse me, punctuated with patches of reds and greens as set within a sea of white and gray tiles. And at a distance, the pieces create a shadowy form that seems like it's within or emerging from the surface that's enhanced by the pentagonal shape of the canvas. So it definitely suggests uh, Jordan's energy and her presence. And Wynne did not have the chance to meet Jordan, but she always, she, he was always impressed by her. And he said, quote, I was deeply inspired by her intelligence. She was a powerful presence who spoke with moral conviction. And we have many black monoliths on view, one that honors uh, Jacob Lawrence with its striking red-orange border that captures the dynamism of Lawrence's paintings, what his paintings are known for. When we have on view a black monolith dedicated to saxophonist Ornette Coleman, who he knew. Um, he, and it was, and Coleman was also known for his free jazz compositions. And there are various depths to this painting. There are black shapes that look like possibly legs or, or saxophones that are cut out to expose the black matte layer underneath, and long vertical sweeps of, of rugged acrylic paint overlaid with a circle of spiraling tesserae. And when you stand before it, everyone, everything seems to be freewheeling or in motion and conveys that layered uh, improvisatory nature of Ornette Coleman's music. Also on view is Black Monolith II, homage to Ralph Ellison, The Invisible Man. And Witten, who had met Ellison, uh, was identified with the narrator of, of Ellison's book, Invisible Man. And that was an unnamed man who lives in the basement of an apartment surrounded by 1,369 light bulbs. And he tells his story of growing up in the segregated South attending a black college and moving to New York where he continued to encounter racism. And in Witten's painting for Ellison, he centered a dark form that recalls a featureless human head and shoulders, and that might be a reference to the title of Ellison's book, The Invisible Man. Um, a razor blade also has been inserted. I don't know if you can see it right there. A razor blade also has been inser inserted, presumably where a face would be, and Witten said that that quote speaks to the double edge of black identity, which, both, which cuts both ways. And the light colored tiles that radiate around him could suggest the light from the light bulbs in the apartment. Um, interestingly, up close, you can see through the light colored transparent tiles and to see eggshells, one of the many ingredients, as you can see, listed uh, in the painting that, are, um, that lies underneath the surface of the tiles. The shape also relates to the stone outcropping near Witten's house in Crete, which actually inspired the Black Monolith series. And you can see the similarity between the painting and the monolith in Crete that's anchored in the, in the landscape, distinct from the hill and the blue sky that surrounds it. And the exhibition ends with Lyknos. The work is made from carob wood, made from Crete, a very tough and stringy wood. Uh, Witten chiseled horizontal rows into the bottom portion and inserted ceramic, excuse me, ceramic, bone, lead, and sharp objects. A smooth horn of mulberry shoots out of the top. Beneath it is a mending plate here that holds the pieces of the wood in place. 
And all, all of it rests on a slab of cinder block coated with the lime solution that's used to whitewash uh, buildings in Crete. And Lignos, so Lignos combines several aspects of major influences in Witten's life and art. Uh, the African horn or symbol of power, the wood and the whitewashed stone of Crete, as well as the mending plate that we might see as a reference to industries of Alabama or a reference to uh, his community where people never threw anything away. They were always mending, recycling, and reusing materials to extend the lives of objects. Uh, finally, as you know, Witten passed, as you probably know, Witten passed about um, a year ago in January of 2018 at the age of 78. Um, which was an incredible loss, but he clearly led um, an amazing life that resulted in the creation of extraordinary work that conveys warmth, creativity, intelligence, and curiosity, all the hallmarks of the best artists and really of the best people. And his works comprise a wide range of scales, textures, shapes, and details that make for a visually complex and appealing show and a very cosmopolitan one. As you can see, the works reflect the inspiration of African sculpture, Southern American folk art, uh, the materials and environments of Crete, ancient Cycladic and Minoan art, indigenous American works, and as well as European modernism. So it's been very exciting to present work that not only has not been seen before this exhibition, but um, largely was not known. And I thank you again to the Witten family for your generosity and for giving us the opportunity to tell the untold story of one of the most important artists of his generation. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions. I think we'll just let people come down if they want to. We're going to close the museum in about 10 minutes, and I, there's a film following here. So, <laughs> But thank you again to Kenitra Fletcher for a uh, wonder. It's a visually such an arresting exhibition. It's, a, it's just so compelling, but now to have some context for it is so, so just deepens that, 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 that arresting moment. So thank you very much for that, and thank you to all for coming. The exhibition will be on view through Memorial Day, which is May 27th, so we, and it's not ticketed, so we hope you'll come back often and just uh, really, really live with these works for a while. I don't think we've had anything quite like this on view in a very long time. So thank you again. Thank you to Ganitra. <laughs>